Here problem that relates to investor confidence, the nation's preparedness, and health concerns. A pair of House subcommittees heard from the president's special Y2K advisor, John Koskinen, and others. Representative Connie Morella opens the nearly two and a half hour hearing. I'm going to gavel the uh, joint subcommittee's uh, hearing to order. You've just heard the beeper, and we're going to have a series of probably about four, maybe even five votes. But I thought I would give an opening statement uh, and then uh, return right after the votes. There's also a markup taking place in um, government reform, which is where our co-chair um, is right now. And that's why you don't have the members here. Uh, they will return, but I will at least comment on what we are here today to, to uh, listen to and what the topic is of the meeting. I want to welcome all of you to the House's Y2K Working Group that's comprised of the Science Committee's Technology Subcommittee and the Government Reform Committee's Government Management Information and Technology Subcommittee. With the anticipated adjournment of the first session of this 106th Congress uh, looming before us, this hearing is expected to be the culmination of our House Y2K Working Group efforts before the January 1st, 2000 deadline. It's sometimes hard to believe that we focused on this issue ever since the spring of 1996, when our two subcommittees held the first congressional hearings three and a half years ago on the then little publicized year 2000 computer problem, the millennium bug seemed to be more suited to the realm of exterminators than Congress. But our Y2K review reveals some troubling news. At that time, our nation was simply not moving forward with the required dispatch to effectively respond to the devastating effects of the mother of all computer glitches, potentially crippling uh, vital government functions, critical industry performance, and our robust economy. Now, we in Congress attempted to step up to the plate by raising awareness about the problem and by pushing federal agencies and private industry toward immediate corrective measures. We did this through a series of comprehensive hearings, vigilantly exercised our oversight authority, and enacted laws that required the creation of a national federal strategy and prohibited the purchase of federal information technology that was not Y2K compliant. It was clear, however, that despite our congressional powers, the legislative branch alone was ill-suited to lead our nation's Y2K efforts. We desperately needed the help of the president's executive powers. We were frustrated by what seemed to be the lack of leadership. It was clear to us that without greater urgency and aggressive agency management, federal agencies were at risk of being unable to provide services or to perform functions that are critical to its mission and vital to the American public. We spent a year urging the president to personally embrace the need for federal action and to appoint a Y2K czar to oversee the nation's public and private sector initiatives until he finally appointed a very capable man who is here today, John Koskinen, to chair the year 2000 Conversion Council. Given the late start in his appointment, John, who was lured out of retirement to take on this Herculean task, obviously had his work cut up for him. And while we have not necessarily agreed on all aspects of our nation's Y2K strategy, I want to say to John that your extremely competent achievements performed with such a high level of professional dedication and commitment to public service really do deserve recognition. Since uh, John's appointment, we in Congress have successfully worked together to require greater federal and private sector disclosures, provide a special federal appropriation solely for Y2K efforts, raise Y2K awareness throughout the country, and enact laws to improve Y2K readiness and to curb the number of frivolous uh, glitch-related uh, lawsuits. Yet as we now move toward the remaining 50 days before the unforgiving and immovable Y2K deadline, Americans still have a number of questions about how, in the midst of all their millennium celebrations around the world, that they will be affected, if at all, by the year 2000 problem. We know the American people are counting on us. This hearing is designed to respond to some of those questions I'm pleased that we have a distinguished panel of witnesses that seek to help us provide some of those answers today. Finally, before I, I uh, turn to our ranking member of the Technology Subcommittee, I want to thank on behalf of both of us, including Chairman Horn, who will be with us later, 
um, and all of our fellow colleagues on the House Y2K Working Group, I want to uh, thank them for their leadership, support, and participation. It's also important to note that our Y2K efforts have been bipartisan. And I want to commend our ranking members, Mr. Bosher of Michigan, who's here with us, Mr. Turner of Texas, Mr. Gordon of Tennessee, Ms. Maloney of New York, Mr. Kucinich of Ohio. And I um, now will be very happy to recognize the ranking member of the Technology Subcommittee, Mr. Bosher, for any opening remarks before we go to vote. Thank you, Chairwoman Morella. I want to uh, return the compliment and thank you for the leadership and the bipartisan nature in which you've uh, conducted the hearings of this subcommittee and the uh, tremendous amount of energy and time that you've invested in uh, this Y2K issue and its importance to the citizens across the country. I want to join my colleagues on the subcommittee in welcoming our distinguished panel to this last hearing of the year 2000 Computer Bug. Over the past three years, we have held hearings on almost every aspect of the Y2K problem, on federal agencies' efforts, international issues, state and local governments' efforts, the impact on industry, and liability. Although confident with the strides uh, made by federal agencies, we continue to be hampered in our assessment of the impact of the year 2000 uh, problem on state and local governments and industry because there is still a lack of factual information on Y2K readiness. I urge our panelists today to provide us with as much specific information as possible about the overall level of Y2K readiness in the United States and abroad, if you can. And uh, if we are to calm public fears, we must provide the public with facts. This series of hearings has served to educate the public about the magnitude and scope of the Y2K problem. And although it has been my experience that most people are aware of the Y2K issue, they still don't have a good understanding of its potential impact or lack of impact. I am concerned because unless we get the message out, the level of public fear could rise. What could be the single largest public awareness announcement? On November 21st, uh, made for television movie entitled Y2K the Movie. According to news reports, this movie has the U.S. government grounding all airplanes, the eastern seaboard experiencing a major power outage, and even worse problems yet to come. In the absence of facts, what is designed to be entertainment could achieve the status of fact. As this is the last hearing, I would like to commend Mr. Joel Willemson and the staff of GAO for the outstanding work that they have done during the past three years. I would also like to commend Mr. Koskinen for the coordination role his office has provided in the administration's Y2K efforts. And, of course, uh, one, finally, I want to uh, thank the witnesses uh, for appearing before us, and I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bausha. Uh, as you probably know from the timing, we, we have to get to go over to vote. We've got about six minutes, uh, if even that, for the vote. There are going to be about five procedural votes. Mr. Koskin and I know you must leave here shortly, so what I will do is go over and vote. If there's a 15-minute interval, come back so we can uh, hear some of your oral testimony. Will there be somebody else here who could also uh, respond to any questions we may have if, when you have to leave? And you have a written testimony for us, too which will be part of the record. So I shall return after our first vote when we have a 15-minute interval. For the rest of you, it'll probably be about three quarters of an hour before we have, uh, we reconvene fully uh, the hearing beyond Mr. Koskinen. Thank you. Uh, the subcommittees themselves deserve great credit for their continuing interest in the Y2K issue. Your efforts have helped to increase the visibility of this important challenge within the federal government and the country as a whole. And with your permission, I'll submit my full statement for the record and summarize it here. No, hearing no objection, so ordered. In keeping with the title for this hearing, let me begin with what I believe are some of the more important myths and realities regarding the Y2K uh, issue. One of the more troubling Y2K myths is the notion that January 1 is a seminal date on which everything or nothing Y2K related will occur. 
As you know, Year 2000 challenges can happen anytime a computer that is not Y2K compliant comes into contact with a Year 2000 date, before or after January 1. In fact, a number of businesses and governments have already had to use Year 2000 dates in their automated operations. Information technology professionals are well aware that the Y2K challenge is not limited to January 1, and they will be monitoring systems well into the new year for flaws in billing and financial cycles and possible slow degradations in service. Another important myth deals with the reporting of Y2K readiness data. It goes something like this. Self-reported Y2K information is not valid since people will not voluntarily report problems. So virtually everything we've heard in terms of industry and government progress reports cannot be believed. This is not true for several reasons. Most organizations have structures in place whereby independent authorities have been reviewing the results of Y2K testing. In some industries, such as electric power, government agencies have conducted selected audits of the reported information and found no major discrepancies. And most importantly, the industry surveys done for the President's Council have been conducted pursuant to the year 2000 Information and Readiness Disclosure Act provisions, which the Congress passed at our urging last year. This act guarantees individual companies that their responses to these surveys will be treated confidentially, which substantially increases the likelihood of candid responses. In the interest of time, let me now move to a discussion of the operation of the Council's Information Coordination Center, or ICC as it's known. The ICC will be the federal government's central point for coordinating a wide range of information on systems operations and events related to the Y2K transition that will be collected by government emergency centers and the private sector. The ICC will gather information about system operations in federal agencies, among state, local, and tribal governments, in critical areas of the private sector and internationally. To accomplish this task, we are relying to the greatest extent possible on existing structures and expertise. Domestically, information on systems operations will be collected by the states and provided through normal channels to FEMA which will review the reports and pass them on to the ICC. In addition, the ICC will receive reports from national information centers established, many for the first time, by the private sector. The status reports will be provided to appropriate lead agencies. We presently have agreements with the electric power, banking, finance, telecommunications, oil, gas, airline, pharmaceutical, and retail industries to operate information centers during the rollover period and to share information on the status of their members with the ICC. The ICC will receive international status reports from the State Department, the Defense Department, the intelligence agencies, private sector information centers, and national Y2K coordinators around the world. In addition, the ICC will work with the National Infrastructure Protection Center and computer emergency response teams here and around the world to monitor unauthorized intrusions into systems. Information gathered by the ICC will be the basis for complete regularly updated national and international status reports that will be provided to all federal agencies and organizations sharing information with the center. These reports will help agency decision makers determine what, if any, federal actions are appropriate in response to Y2K related difficulties. Status reports will also be provided on a regular basis to the Congress and to the public. As I mentioned earlier, based on available information, we do not believe the Y2K issue will create significant problems in the United States. But no one can rule out the possibility that there will be temporary disruptions in some services. This week, we published Y2K and You, an informational booklet on the Y2K issue, as well as a Y2K preparedness checklist, which I am submitting as part of the record. Our suggestions include preparing for the long holiday weekend by having at least a three-day supply of food and water, keeping copies of important financial records before and after January 1, 2000, and checking with manufacturers to make sure that home electronic equipment is Y2K ready. Perhaps most importantly, whatever people are going to do to prepare, they should do it early. If everyone waits until the last moment to take even modest precautions, supply systems could be overwhelmed. When I appeared before you in January of this year, I closed by saying that overreaction by the public to real or perceived Y2K risks was in some ways our greatest challenge. I still believe that. On the other hand, our goal is not public complacency. All of us need to encourage the public to take the appropriate steps to be ready for the date change. As I said in January, the way to achieve this delicate balance is to provide people with as much information as possible about Y2K readiness efforts, the good and the bad. Thank you for the opportunity to continue this process of information sharing here today.
I'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have uh, now or in the future. Thank you, Mr. Koskinen. Um, I'm now pleased to recognize Mr. Willemson, but uh, as I do, I just want to comment on the fact that the GAO mission is to independently audit all federal government agencies, and we have worked very closely with GAO over the past three and a half years on the year 2000 computer problem. And just as uh, John Koskinen has demonstrated an exemplary dedication and, and a commitment to public service, so has Joel uh, Willemson. He's uh, always been ready to assist his contributions to our House Y2K working group's efforts can't be uh, understated, and he has been very much appreciated. And while he may have been a thorn in the side of agencies that required greater congressional attention, he's also one of the reasons that those agencies uh, have um, redoubled their efforts to comply with the Y2K computer glitch. So in welcoming Mr. Koskinen, I welcome Mr. Willemson for his comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Morello. Thank you for inviting us to testify today. And as requested, I'll briefly summarize our statement. In early 1997, we identified Y2K as a high-risk area for the federal government. Since that time, we've observed substantial progress in the federal government's Y2K readiness. While this progress has been significant, it has not been uniform among all federal agencies. Some agencies have long had strong Y2K programs. Others have made dramatic improvements, while still others must continue to be monitored carefully. For example, on one end of the spectrum is the Social Security Administration, which started its program 10 years ago, has been very responsive to any issues that have surfaced, and has been a government-wide leader in such areas as contingency planning and day one planning. Departments such as Veterans Affairs and Education have made major strides in readiness after relatively slow starts. Other agencies and departments have also made major progress, but still need to be monitored closely because of the criticality of information systems to their missions and the work that remains outstanding. These agencies would include the Health Care Financing Administration, the Department of Defense, <coughs> FAA, and IRS. For example, DOD reports that it still has 31 mission-critical systems that are not Y2K compliant. Six of these are not expected to be compliant until December. Beyond the compliance of individual systems, significant progress has also been made in improving the government's overall approach. For example, OMB has identified 43 high-impact programs as the government's top priorities. And further agencies are performing end-to-end -end testing of multiple systems supporting key business functions, and they've developed business continuity and contingency plans and day one strategies. Regarding state governments, the available inf information indicates that states have greatly improved their readiness during this year, with only four states now reporting less than 75% of mission critical systems completed, compared to 40 states reporting this status earlier this year. Nevertheless, there's still much work to do for many of these states. For example, as we testified last month, many states were not planning to be compliant for some key human services programs, such as Medicaid, food stamps, and child support enforcement until the last quarter of 99. Y2K is also a challenge for the public infrastructure and key economic sectors. Uh, our work's identified sectors that are clearly leaders on Y2K, while others are lagging behind. For example, banking and finance, clearly been a Y2K leader. Among the areas, however, most at risk are health care and education. For health care, we've testified on numerous occasions on the risks facing Medicare, Medicaid, and biomedical equipment. We remain concerned about the overall readiness of this sector. Regarding education, recent surveys conducted by the Federal Department of Education show that many school districts and post-secondary institutions are not yet compliant. And in September, our report on the Y2K readiness of 25 of the nation's largest school districts revealed that only seven believed that all their mission-critical systems were compliant, and nine said they didn't plan to finish until December. That concludes a summary of my statement, and I'll be pleased to address any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Willemson. I know that uh, Mr. Koskinen is going to have to leave us soon, and we have another vote. Um, I guess I'd 
I'm, like I'm actually here till 3.30, so... Till 3.30. <laughs> oh, very good. I, I guess I'll start off with the um, concept that I have heard from some quarters that um, there's been a little criticism uh, from the Y2K community, um, m maybe because you represent the government, but the criticism has been that you've been overly optimistic about your assessments um, and that, you know, what you should say should be sort of... Uh, taken with a grain of salt. Um, I wonder, um, how do you respond to those critics? Um, uh, you base a lot of your assessments on uh, self-reporting, and I wonder how much faith do you have in the self-reported data and picking up also on what Mr. Willemson had said about the areas of education and health. Uh, well, there are a few things to note. First, there's a very small mi minority of uh, uh, people out there who are in the uh, activist community who, uh, who do think that, in fact, uh, we're going to confront much greater uh, uh, damage and challenges than the evidence supports. None of those people have any evidence that disputes any of the surveys that have been presented, any of the uh, information provided by the private sector or the government. Uh, so at this point, I, our view ha is and continues to be that we have an obligation to the public to provide them all the information we have, the good information and the areas we're troubled about. Those who have been concerned about whether we're too over, uh, overly optimistic have been unhappy that we think that the critical infrastructure in this country indeed is going to work, that power, telecommunications, banking, finance, air traffic systems all have been demonstrated to be ready. Uh, but they have ignored the fact that we have, in fact, for some time, uh, certainly in the last year, been pointing to areas where we are concerned. We've been concerned about developing countries abroad, as Mr. William, Willemson has noted, we've been concerned about, and our surveys have demonstrated the risks involved in smaller institutions in healthcare and education, in small businesses, at, local, at the local government level. Uh, so that I think what you have to do is take with a grain of salt uh, those people who are concerned about whether we're over-optimistic or under-optimistic. The real issue is what are the facts as we know them, what are the facts as industries have them, and then people need to respond accordingly. Our view has been all we're doing is telling you what we know what we've been told. I talked in my prepared statement and my oral statement about why we have reasonable confidence in the survey data that's been provided because it's been provided confidentially. And as noted, if people were going to make it up, they would have made up total compliance some time ago, and the surveys have not done that. You know, I, no I do notice that um, organizations, businesses, and even communities are coming out with their Y2K checklists, and obviously we have yours. Um, I received one recently from um, <laughs> Uh, an area that I represent, and it's a little bit troublesome, the, the list of items that they say one might must need. You must change from standard incandescence to compact fluorescence and halogen, replace all appliances, solar panels and wind generators, composting toilets, uh, reflector-powered ovens, crank-powered radio, uh, et cetera. It, it goes on and on with a whole list of things. Do you think that Again, on the other side, that there are areas or people that are, are actually um, contributing to panic? Well, there are clearly those uh, for, from the start over the last three to four years who have, for one reason or another, been predicting the end of the world as we know it uh, on the ground that this is a massive problem, which indeed it is, but their prediction has been we'll never be able to solve it. And my disagreement with them has not been that it's a massive problem. It has been with whether we'll be able to solve it. I think there are still people pushing that uh, if you don't buy a lot in New Mexico and leave town, at a minimum, you ought to be prepared for three to six months supplies, which I think there's no evidence to support. On the other hand, there are concerned civic groups that think that more than three days supplies are necessary. And our view has been, and our brochure talks about, at least three days supply. And we stress that people need to take a look at their own circumstances. In the community conversations we've run across the United States, when I was in Miami, there they were talking about preparations of seven to ten days, because that's their experience with hurricanes. In Los Angeles, their standard is a week. What we have said is everyone needs to take a look at what their own personal situation is, what the situation is where they live. If you're in a rural community and it takes longer to find you, you will have a different approach to it. If you live in Minnesota, your approach will be different than if you're in Florida. And so what we think is important, again, is for everybody to decide, in light of the facts as they see them, what they feel most comfortable about. Clearly, uh, we think if the whole country decided that they want to do at the last minute, uh, have months' supplies of food and water, or in fact take a lot of other action activities, that by itself could create a problem where there is no uh, basis for one. You've been trying to create a balance, I can see. 
Uh, Mr. Wu uh, is uh, from the gentleman from Oregon on our subcommittee, may not be able to return after the next vote, so I'm going to let him ask a question. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel, uh, as you all know, the Securities and Exchange Commission has for some time required that uh, private companies, or I should say uh, private companies which are publicly held, uh, make uh, disclosure of uh, Y2K vulnerability in their annual statements on Form 10-K. Uh, how satisfied are you that uh, these publicly held companies have, as they say, made a full and fair uh, disclosure of their Y2K <laughs> vulnerabilities uh, under the circumstances as warranted? Uh, we have not made a judgment about that. We have not reviewed those in, uh, in any detail. We have been uh, more comfortable and confident with the information we've collected through the in industry associations because, again, that's information provided with a guarantee under the statute that is confidential, it will not be reached, cannot be reached by litigants or even the federal government. Uh, there is a dispute. Some companies are uh, held up as models of disclosure in the SEC filings. Others are held up as models of obf obfuscation. And I think it obviously runs across the uh, spectrum. Uh, but the judgments about the adequacy of that, I think, are appropriate uh, judgments for the SEC to make since it's their regulations and their filings. But Mr. Willemson may have a different view. Congressman, we have not done an analysis of those submissions, so I'm not in a position to address that question. Well, the gentlemen, we're going to then um, uh, recess uh, for probably about 15 minutes, and we'll return. Good. Maybe this says something about Y2K, that the last meeting is so chaotic. Now, this just demonstrates we have glitches even in advance of Y2K. <coughs> Thank you very much. When you listed the uh, items that you suggested people have in preparation, I noticed it was uh, food and water primarily. January 1 is, uh, uh, in the northern part of our country, very cold. It's also just a few days after the shortest day in a year with a lot of darkness. A few flashlight batteries probably won't suffice. What advice do you give relative to heat and light? Uh, at uh, this point, we do not advise anybody to take uh, power into their own hands and go buy generators. Again, unless, uh, you know, if you're out in the rural area, uh, if you're at risk uh, in the wintertime from uh, long-term power outages, uh, if Y2K is the first time you ever decide to deal with it, that's important to do it. But we don't think, in light of what we know, that there's any risk. The power industry will operate that weekend normally at 50 percent of capacity. Uh, they will have all of the capacity or most of it spinning that weekend, so we can lose a lot of power companies, which we don't expect to lose any of them, uh, before we'll run out of power. The oil and gas industry is basically close to 95 percent done with their work. They will, in fact, have uh, oil and gas readily available. So at this juncture, uh, we don't see any indication that we're going to have any outages. There will be glitches that will last more than, uh, than a few minutes. So the question about what happens if the power goes out in the wintertime is a long-term question we need people need to address regularly. We have ice storms and blizzards, and in fact, your chances of having power outages are greater, I think, because of an ice storm or a blizzard than Y2K. And the question is, what do you do in those circumstances in your communities? There have been uh, places in the United States in the Northeast in uh, blizzards and ice storms that have had power outages for days rather than hours. And the answer is, whatever their emergency plans and backup systems are for those situations, uh, obviously would it be applicable here. We do not think there's a Y2K necessity to, ch uh, to change, to deal with those issues beyond what you normally deal with. My personal feeling is that uh, it will come and go and we'll hardly notice it. But I also think that tonight will come and go and my house will not burn. But still, I have fire insurance on my house. So as a prudent person, I think that it's incumbent on us to have the equivalent of fire insurance for... Uh, uh, 
uh, for this possibility. Uh, looking at it that way, what would you say would be the equivalent of uh, the fire insurance policy you have on your home for uh, uh, Y2K? Uh, we think uh, the equivalent of fire insurance on your home is the checklist we've put out. Again, as I say, if you think you're at risk of power going out, I think your greater risk is in an ice storm, and you ought to be prepared for this weekend the same way you're prepared for the possibility of an ice storm. What happens in ice storms is people go to shelters, they go to places, power usually is not out everywhere, they go to places where there are powers. We have not had a problem in the United States through any of the great blizzards or ice storms in this country uh, with people suffering uh, because of the lack of heater power. And whatever those processes are, the emergency managers around the United States are prepared with their normal precautions, and we've in fact been in close contact with them, and they're prepared to respond as they always do in the wintertime if there are any outages. What concerns many people about the power grid is that uh, it tends to fall back on itself a minor problem in one place can, like uh, dominoes, cause major problems in other places like the Great Northeast Blackout and, and subsequent blackouts that were supposed to be fixed and couldn't happen, yet they did happen. Do we have con contingency plans so this kind of thing won't happen? Uh, the power industry is prepared. As I say, first of all, we have, will have substantial excess capacity. And in fact, if there's any challenge to the grid, it will be lowered load demand rather than increased load demand to make sure we have stability. They, as I say, will have most of their systems spinning, not producing power on the grid, but basically available to fill in if need be. They will make sure that there is room on the transmission lines to transmit power from area to area in case there is any need for that to be done so that they, in fact, have run two national contingency plan exercises if uh, testing what, how to run power plants without telecommunications, what their other contingency plans are, and they've gone through all of that with virtually uh, all, every major power company in the United States in April and September, and they are extremely confident. Their business is reliability. Their uh, responsibility is responding to emergencies, and they are prepared to do that. How do they uh, simulate the embedded chip problem? I understand with computers, uh, uh, we should be having some problems now because of Y2K, because many computers are looking ahead several months. Right. And I'm not seeing any problems, so I suspect that in terms of the programming, that's been pretty well fixed. But uh, what about the concern about embedded chips, where there is no way to test them ahead of time? If it's a generic chip and you're not using the time function, but if it has a, a date code in it, uh, the chip, I understand, could shut down anyhow. How are they testing for embedded chips? And are they prepared to wire around these uh, tens of thousands of embedded chips that are in components that they really cannot test for? I embedded chips have been an issue that the industries generally, in, in addition to electric power, have been focused on. At this point, no one has found an example, even though the web pages and the doomsayers continue to say there are functions in there for clocks that if you're not using are going to shut you down. No one yet has been able to provide a case where functionality not being used actually shut the production down. And in fact, uh, the power companies have not found a Y2K problem that would shut down, a uh, failure that would shut down production. But what they're all doing is they have reviewed those uh, chips. They know where they are. Uh, they have reviewed them with manufacturers. Wherever they can, they have rolled the SCADA control systems and other systems forward to see what will happen. But the bottom line is, the reason we're all talking about nobody can give guarantee perfection is until we actually roll, either at Greenwich Mean Time, some are set by Greenwich Mean Time, some are set on midnight, until we roll through those, we won't be able to conclusively demonstrate there's no problem. But at this point, I would, est I would stress, no one has reported a problem where you could track it to a system that had that hidden clock problem that you're talking about. Greenwich Mean Time is 7 p.m. here, is that correct? 7 p.m., New Year's Eve. So if there's going to be a, uh, an embedded chip problem, you'll expect it at 7 p.m. and not midnight? Uh, no, we will expect it depends on uh, how the systems are structured and where they take their time uh, deriv derivation. Uh, but Some, for all of those chips that have Greenwich Mean Time, it will be 7 p.m. It will be 7 p.m. So 7 p.m. New Year's Eve, we'll know a lot. We'll actually know a lot starting at 7 a.m. New Year's Eve because New Zealand will go into the year 2000 at 7, Australia will go at 9, and we will monitor how the world is doing. And if there are going to be systemic problems, will have plenty of warning uh, in terms of whether they are systemic and occurring. My last question. Several uh, months ago, the uh, power industry testified before this committee. They told us then that because of the tens of thousands of embedded chips that they probably wouldn't be ready, but they were sure they could wire around it. Has that changed? Uh, 
All I know is what uh, the, the public information and surveys from them are, is, and that is that they are prepared. Uh, they think that they have done now 100 percent of their work, including looking and uh, working on embedded chips and being able to respond. Uh, and we have no information that any power company is not prepared for the rollover. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. I now wanted to uh, uh, ask Mr. Beard from the state of Washington if he wanted to ask any questions. Mr. Beard. Thank you, Madam Chair. One of the uh, concerns I have is I, I sort of did a mental checklist of my district and said, what are the various potential problems? And for example, we have large chemical manufacturing plants not that far away from uh, um, residential areas. And the, one of the questions I had was, let's suppose the worst case scenario. Let's suppose power outage uh, comes along. That uh, impairs certain uh, procedural uh, machines or something within the, uh, the uh, chemical processor. They begin to have a breakdown. Dangerous chemicals are released into the environment. We've got communications problems and transportation problems. The, 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 I, I'm not a doomsdayist by any means, but if I were a local community, I would like to have run through those various scenarios. To what extent do you believe local communities have done that, and, and uh, what, what should they do, it, or what should we do if they haven't done it yet? Uh, I think some communities have, and unfortunately some communities have not. Uh, we have, we held a White House roundtable on chemical uh, manufacturing. Uh, we uh, had a press conference produced a lot of information we're trying to uh, reach out. Uh, we pro I have written a personal letter to every governor in the United States drawing their attention to the problem, to the, the programs that California and New Jersey have for reaching out to the local levels. Uh, but clearly it is, exactly as you note, an emergency preparedness problem at the local level. And we've encouraged the companies to be in touch with their local emergency planners uh, but the local emergency managers and public officials need to make sure that they know, and they should know again, up for, for beyond Y2K purposes, where those plants are, what uh, the uh, emergency preparedness is, and most importantly, I think, is to ensure that people are on alert over that weekend and people know exactly immediately how to get in touch with each other and what the plans are if there are any difficulties, uh, whether, again, it's from Y2K or for some other purpose. I personally see Y2K as a potential benefit in the sense that it helps us improve our emergency readiness. Are there particular uh, checklists or steps they should go through? For example, a community working with the chemical industry, and how would we get a hold of that for our own districts? Uh, EPA and the chemical manufacturers produced a manual of the items that are at risk for a smaller chemical facility that they should be checking, uh, and that's available on, uh, on the EPA website. The council, I'm sure you can get to that uh, through the council website of www.y2k.gov. Uh, that material has been provided to every state. Uh, and uh, uh, FEMA and the emergency managers have it. So I think that what I, my suggestion in a community would be their local emergency manager should uh, contact their state or FEMA to get any additional uh, scenario development or testing that should go on so that they can ensure that they're ready for that particular kind of problem. And I think you're right. The emergency managers across the United States think that Y2K is a great opportunity for individuals as well as organizations to review their emergency planning and preparedness and, in fact, to be better prepared than they may have been generally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Baird. Uh, Mr. Osi, have any questions? As a matter of fact, before we ask this question, I was on a panel with a Red Cross representative who said that what we should, you reminded me of it, Mr. Baird, is that what we should have on hand is what we should always have on hand. Right. And, and I think that's something that makes us take inventory. Mr. Osi from California. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a couple questions. Some, uh, some weeks ago we had a hearing, and I think Mr. Williamson was there, regarding the FAA and the relative responses we've had from some of our international partners. At that time, we were able to dig out, ferret out information about a number of countries that had not yet responded to our Y2K circular questioning their preparedness or inquiring of it. And I think the total number of countries at that time was 34 or 35. I'm curious whether or not there's been any update to that list of 34 or 35. Uh, there has been. Uh, the, the Department of Transportation and the FAA both have websites now listing the information they have about preparedness internationally as well as domestically. And uh, I don't know what the number now is, but there has been an increase in the response. And transportation has now been able to categorize uh, the nature of those responses and any concerns they have about particular airports so that uh, the public or travel agents have direct access to that. 
Madam Chair, the reason I bring this up is I want to take a moment, and I hope no one falls over here in shock, I want to take a moment and express my appreciation to Mr. Koskinen and Mr. Williamson and the others who work in the federal government, because I will, I will tell you, we had this hearing on like uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, and we were asking for this information, and the agencies of the federal government, in response to the request from members of Congress, were able by Friday to refine the list from approximately 110 countries to 34 or 35 that had not responded. And the reason that's important is that, as with many people, uh, I mean, my wife and I travel a great deal, and people in the United States travel a great deal. And the uncertainty that existed prior to the refinement of that list relative to these 70 or 80 other countries that were on the list uh, were creating quite a bit of havoc amongst people's travel plans because as they, as they travel, they plan ahead 90 or 120 days. So I want to take this moment to express my appreciation to these two gentlemen and to the others who can't, couldn't join us today for making that list public for helping the American public define where it might be safe to go and where it might be safe not to go, where it might, where it might not be safe to go, because uh, they really did the people's business and they deserve our uh, applause or whatever, I mean, what, whatever you call it. So now the, I want to go from him. The FAA does have a website on which this data is posted. If I understand correctly, it's uh, fly2k.gov? Correct. And I would encourage everyone to visit that who's planning on traveling over the, the millennium turn. And finally, one little tidbit, Madam Chair, if I could. Uh, the businesses that I used to run before I came to Congress, we have any number of security features in each of those businesses, and we did a little test of our own about our Y2K preparedness. We, in effect, took the calendars on our computers and rolled them forward to where they were like five minutes prior to midnight on the 31st. And we were, we were essentially doing our self-testing. And to those people who haven't done that, I would encourage you to do that now rather than wait until the last week of December. We were fortunate. We were in compliance. But it's just, it's just a little self-test everybody might engage in. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Josie, and, and uh, you reflect uh, the views of uh, both subcommittees in commendation to the agencies, Mr. Koskin and, and uh, Mr. Willemson and all of the others that responded so promptly. I think we've all found that to be the case. I'm now pleased to recognize Ms. Rivers, the gentlewoman from Michigan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have only a very brief question. Uh, there are uh, a number of materials that are interesting and useful here um, in preparation and also the GAO information on uh, evaluating how things are going. M most of us have websites that, that our constituents visit on a regular basis. Are we free to, to link to your websites or to use any of these materials on our, on our we, sites? We would be delighted to have you link. We'd be delighted to have you take anything on the website and put it on your website. Okay, Mr. Williams? Anything? Certainly. Great. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, Ms. Rivers. I'm now pleased to uh, recognize Ms. Bigger, gentlewoman from Illinois. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, if I might ask uh, unanimous consent to uh, enter in my statement into the record, without objection, uh, so ordered. I'm also going to, uh, uh, without objection have uh, Mr. Horn, Chairman Horn's opening statement also included in the record, and anyone else on no. both subcommittees who would like to have it so, happen. This has been an unusual day. I apologize for, <laughs> for missing the, the, your statements. But I'd like to ask, uh, just have you heard rumors or um, about Y2K that you'd like to dispel? Is there something that, that you hear out there that you would uh, have uh, concern about that I appreciate that question. In the, my formal statement, we have listed the myths and the rumors okay. that generally we're concerned about. I suppose uh, it goes back to the uh, uh, chairwoman's question. The ultimate rumor I would like to dispel is that somehow we have information in the federal government or in the president's council that we're not sharing with the public. Mm -hmm. And there uh, is no evidence. Nobody's ever been able to establish something we know that we haven't told. And in fact, our strategy for uh, now going on to two years has been to share with the public everything we have as we get it. 
So the, uh, as I say, I think the rumor that there's this secret information that we're somehow afraid to release uh, is just that, a rumor. Uh, our goal in life is to have uh, the American public feel they know everything I know and can then decide to how to respond appropriately. Okay. Mr. Williamson? Is I would also echo Mr. Koskinen's comment. Uh, obviously, we're come at this from an audit and evaluation perspective. We've seen all the data as as best as I know that uh, Mr. Koskinen has available to the extent that we identify that data, we take the opportunity to publicize it in our reports and testimonies. Uh, and that's why one thing we want to do today in our testimony was reflect the broad nature of everything we have done and the kind of progress that's been made while at the same time pointing out some uh, residual risks. Well, certainly we've... Um I spent a lot of time, had a lot of hearings, and I think that I would like to commend the, uh, the two chairmen of these two committees for, for everything that they have done and certainly started long before I got here uh, this year working on this. Is there anything that you think that we as the Congress have missed doing that we should have done um, on the Y2K problem? Uh, I don't think so. We've had, I think, uh, again, the chairwoman was right, this has been a very bipartisan issue. We have not had any uh, concern in either House of Congress about uh, any kind of political issues entering into this. We've had uh, great support. Uh, we've obviously had a very good working relationship with GAO as well, uh, working on behalf of the Congress. So if we had to do it again, uh, there's nothing that we've asked of the Congress that uh, has not been granted to us. So I think it's been a very good example of uh, cooperation between the legislative and executive branch dealing with what is a uh, serious uh, national challenge. Okay. Looking forward, um, I would say the one thing that the Congress can still uh, be of great benefit to the citizenry is letting and reminding the citizens know what the facts are. I think as we're into November and we turn into December, there is going to be the opportunity for some to view this uh, um, in survivalist terms, uh, if you may, uh, that it really is going to be much, it's going to be much worse than it actually will be. So I think it, uh, the Congress can still serve a very useful role in informing the public of what the facts are, uh, what the readiness is, where we do have some risks, but the, the overriding fact is we are in much, much better prepared state today uh, than we have been. Secondly, um, to the extent that problems do occur, uh, major federal agencies and uh, most private organizations are planning detailed day one strategies uh, to be prepared in the event that disruptions occur. I think there was something in the paper the other day is that everybody should not get on the phone at 12.01 and say everything's okay because it's going to jam the telecommunication lines. That, uh, That's right. We uh, refer to it and our checklist does that too. There's likely to be Mother's Day by multiples <laughs> if uh, everybody both celebrating uh, the millennium mm -hmm. and also just checking in. Mm -hmm. Uh, does that at one time. At a minimum, what people should understand, if you don't get a dial tone immediately or you get a rapid dial, it's very likely not to be a Y2K problem, but to be the fact mm -hmm. that your neighbors and everybody else have joined you uh, on the phone at the same time. Right. Uh, well, thank you very much thank you. for all your hard work. and. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Madam Th thank Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Bigger. I'm, I'm afraid I have over 50 people on this uh, conference call that I noted I need to uh, join. Uh, uh, I hate to deprive uh, your co-chair here of right. his uh, chances to. I don't to think you're going to deprive. Me. <laughs> uh, but I am going to have to leave. I'd, I'd be happy Fine. to take your uh, a question or two, and then I'm going to have to go. All right. If you had to do it over again, when you started, were appointed in February of '98, and you started in April of '98. What would you advise Congress and a president to do in terms of the type of structure or communications or whatever? Say we had something similar to this, where all of our computers were crashing because of people that were using sort of economic t terrorism, if you will. How would you deal with that? And would you deal any differently than you've done? Uh I would not change, for certainly for the Y2K issue, anything that we've done. I think, again, we've had great cooperation with the Congress. I think our basic approach has been uh, validated by the amount of progress that's been made. I think there was no way, as some suggested, that we could legislate our way out of this problem, that to, in fact, start telling everybody how to do it. What we needed to do was marshal uh, the expertise and the energy of people in the private sector as well as the public sector. I think your point's well taken in terms of going forward. 
and that is we're going to become more reliant rather than less on information technology in the future, which means we'll be more vulnerable rather than less to terrorists, to hackers, to others who want to, in fact, disrupt our systems. And therefore, I think we do need to be prepared for that. Uh, but at this juncture, uh, I don't have a, a proposal as to how we ought to move from this issue to that in terms of structuring to deal with it. All I can tell you is I think the structure worked very effectively for the crisis we knew we were facing uh, when I took on this role. Well, in terms of getting the work done in a timely way, don't you think February of 98 was a little late and shouldn't the early Clinton administration and the Bush administration been involved in this? After all, Social Security showed the way and they did 100 percent. Well, as I said uh, when you asked me that question uh, over a year ago, we'll know the answer to that in terms of whether we get through, how we get through this process uh, effectively. As I say, we at this, this point, the gov federal government is over 99 percent done. Uh, there, are, I don't think, are any uh, risks in the federal processes that would have been avoided otherwise. As you know, when I was in the government before, we started a cross-government issue dealing with this in 1995. So that uh, hindsight's always uh, interesting, but at this point, uh, we don't have a view uh, that we'd be in a whole lot different shape. That would, might, might have been a little less hectic uh, if we could have gotten people's attention. But you have to understand, as you remember, when you were one of the lone voices raising this issue back when we were working on it. April in of 1996. Yes, and, and, and that nothing time, much happened yeah, until and February. So, uh, 98. 98. Well, but what we both had, and I had that same experience, is in 1995 and 96, even for people who should have known better, the year 2000 seemed like a long way off. And it was our biggest challenge, even uh, when we all started working together in February of 98, biggest challenge was getting people to understand they needed to pay attention to this, not just as another issue, but as their top priority in terms of the threat it made to their ability to operate. And I think, uh, you know, you started early, the government started early, but I think it's human nature uh, not to focus on things uh, any earlier than uh, you can make people do that. Well, I know a lot of government operates just like universities do. Uh, your neck has to be in the guillotine or you're pushed against the wall and then finally something happens. There are a lot of people in the private sector who still haven't even gotten there yet, so it's not just a government well, or a university Well, that's my problem. next question to you. And I, this will have to be yeah. the last one I really am. All right. Uh, in August, you reported confidence and concerns in various public and private sectors. For example, the council expressed, quote, high degree of confidence, unquote, in major domestic areas like financial institutions, electric power, and the federal government. However, the council expressed concerns with local governments, health care, education, and small businesses. The president's council plans to issue its final Y2K port next, uh, report next Wednesday. And I guess I would ask you, in foreshadowing your forthcoming report, what domestic and international areas are you still concerned with? Uh, uh, again, we're pulling that report together, and we still have some information being provided by sectors. Just whisper me. A, uh, whisper uh, in the air just to... Yeah. Uh, uh, basically, we do not have new sectors that we're uh, now more, any more concerned about than we were there then. What's hardest for us to measure is how much progress is being made in the areas we're concerned about. Uh, last week, uh, we had an event with the Department of Education in which it was noted that Educational institutions, for instance, have made substantial progress. They've gone from about a third readiness of the organizations to two-thirds, which is the good news. The bad news is that still means a third of them are not prepared at this time, both higher education and elementary and secondary. So that I think what uh, the best way to summarize the difference between August and November will be that progress continues to be made, but there are still going to be organizations that are at great risk because they're going to be talking about finishing their work in December and that doesn't give them any margin for error, which is, means that they, of all people, need to have contingency plans and backup plans. Because if you're planning to finish your work in December, there's a reasonable chance something won't work well. You won't have time to test adequately. You need to be prepared uh, with a backup plan. Will the council be pushing for that right up to December 31st? We will push, we will push testing. We, our view is you need to keep working on remediation, on testing, retesting, and on contingency plans with every day and every hour you have left in this year, even if you think you're done today. I think you will recall a couple of months ago I sent a letter to the Secretary of Education, copied you, and talked to you about right. it. I haven't heard much action. Is anything happening? I heard some press release or something the Secretary did that, gee, it's tough with K-12. I mean... We've written, uh, the Secretary and I, to uh, every superintendent of education, every state department. We have written to uh, local superintendents. We had have had meetings since then. We have provided technical information. The department since then has done another telecommunication to sites all around the United States. 
Uh, again, at some point, it's a little like our problem with some small businesses. You can lead them to the water, but you can't make them fix their systems. Well, I was looking for the secretary to say, look, it's going to take X amount to help K-12. Let me reprogram the money. And I think Congress would have permitted him to reprogram the money. So uh, that's what's bothered me. Uh, you know, it just seems like a little bit of drift. Right. And I'll let you off on that happy note. Thank you. And Thanks Mr. Thank you all very much. Mr. Mr. Turner will be, uh, will be asking this question of Mr. Willemson. Uh, you, are you going to be the media spokesperson in the ICC? Pardon, I'm going to be the media you, spokesperson. You'll be the one I will be there. contact yes. us. That's, we'll be in uh, touch. Yeah. Thank you very I much. I get all the good jobs. <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank and I apologize for having you. Thank you for that you have week. done. Look thank forward you. to staying in touch with you now. Mr. Willemson, do you mind staying here for, with the next panel? Would that be all right? Certainly. Excellent. Thank you. You've been very patient from the beginning to the end. Great. So I'm going to ask the next panel if they would come forward. That'll be uh, Mr. Campbell, Mr. Schur, Mr. Margolis. Mr. Cringely, uh, Robert Cringely, unfortunately couldn't be joining us today. And so leading off on the second panel is Mr. Pat Campbell the chief operating officer of the NASDAQ stock market, the largest stock market in the world in terms of dollar value of shares traded, and whose composite index hit an all-time high, cresting over at over 3,000 just yesterday. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Campbell is going to discuss with us some of the concerns affecting investor confidence in the stock market. Next on our panel is Mr. Barry Sherp, who is the vice president of Giant Food, the largest retail food pharmacy chain serving the Mid-Atlantic region. And we've asked Mr. Sherp to uh, talk about Y2K marketing and what Americans can expect as they go to the stores before and after January 1, 2000. And rounding out our second panel is Mr. Ronald Margolis, the chief information officer at the University of New Mexico Hospitals in, in Albuquerque. Mr. Margolis is also speaking on behalf of the American Hospital Association that represents nearly 5,000 hospitals, health systems, networks, and other providers of, of care. Mr. Margolis will discuss with us some of the strong Y2K collaborations with hospitals, emergency services, and the government that he helped to create in Albuquerque. He will also help us to uh, review some of the concerns dealing with hospitals and whether Americans can expect to receive necessary medical treatment as we begin the new millennium. And additionally, um, the American Medical Association has submitted written testimony, and I seek unanimous consent to insert into the record and hearing no objections, so ordered. Uh, gentlemen, would you also uh, rise and raise your right hand, and I will administer the oath. You don't have to do it, Mr. Wilson. Once is enough. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Again, the record will show an affirmative response. What we, what we traditionally do is allow about five minutes um, for any opening statement that you may have, recognizing the fact that any written statement you've given us in its entirety will be included in the record. And so we will then um, um, start off with, if you have no, no particular preference, Mr. Schur, then do you want to start off? Thank you very much. My name is Barry Shear. I'm Vice President for Giant Food. We operate 175 stores in Virginia, Maryland, the District of Columbia, New Jersey, and in Delaware. Mm -hmm. We are also a part of the Royal Ajo family. A Netherlands Chair, yes. um, I think that we had already said that Mr. Campbell would go first. I was simply looking at the manner in which we were seated. So, Mr. Would you prefer to go first, Mr. Campbell? No, he, let him go. Either way. I, Thank you very much. Thank you. He's a good friend. I mean, he understands. Thank you. We are a part, Giant is a part of the Royal Ajo family, a Netherlands-based international food retailer. In the United States alone, Ajo owns, aside from Giant Food, Stop and Shop based in Boston, Tops based in Buffalo, Bilo from Malden, South Carolina, and Giant Food Stores of Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Our preparations for Y2K at Giant have been going on since 1996. We have been checking our numerous systems one by one to certify them as Y2K compliant. Although our administrative tests have given us a very high level of assurance that we will enter Y2K without system failures, our certification tests could not test how the systems would work together as they do every day at Giant when we enter the new year. 
These early Y2K certifications were performed on system environments that were virtually identical to those that we use every day. In August, the Y2K workhorses took on a new role at Giant. We ran our systems in a computer lab that simulated all the computer systems in a real store environment. There, our team moved the test systems clocks to December 31. As the minutes and hours ticked away, the systems were used and monitored as they would in a real store to see how they would operate as we entered the new year. We also wanted to see how they would handle the leap year day, February 29, 2000. In the lab, everything worked just fine. We could place orders, ship, select, receive, weigh, and scan product, keep track of everyone's time and attendance, process prescriptions, and so on. Yet there still loomed a larger question. Would all of these systems, stores, security, non-store environments, work together when the clock struck midnight and the new millennium began? We decided that what we needed at Giant was a fully integrated test, doing exactly what we did in the lab, that's advanced the clock to the end of the year in an actual working store while all of the systems were being used. Our concern was that the potential impact that we would have on our business and the inconvenience to our customers if we feel tested as customers shopped. Then, as so often happens, out of adversity, opportunity not. In early September, we closed a store in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. With no buyers available, the store was vacated and all the remaining product was shipped to a neighboring store. But before tearing out the computer systems and scales, our Y2K team was able to utilize this empty but fully operational store to test our company's IT systems. On September 28th, Giant put the computer systems to the ultimate Y2K test. They all passed, all of them, from EBT to DSD to POS. And these are food industry terms, meaning such things as electronic benefit transfer, direct store delivery of product, and POS, which is point of sale, or the front end checkouts. The whole alphabet passed with flying colors. While we're very confident in our own IT systems, we realize that there is always a chance that something could go wrong on 1-1-2000. As a result, we have developed a very comprehensive set of Y2K contingency plans that have been distributed just today, as a matter of fact, to all of our store and non-food and non-store management associates. Now, in anticipation of peaks in consumer demands for certain products, we're also developing specific merchandising plans that include buying and distribution strategies. The focus will be on spreading the expected increased demand across the next few months by offering exciting promotions for certain products prior to the holidays. And when the holidays arrive, Giant Support System will not go on vacation. An expanded team of support associates will be on hand at Landover, where we are headquartered, and others will be on call to address any and all issues that might arise come January 1, 2000. We have also developed an internal and external communications plan. Our objective has been to inform and educate a number of stakeholders about our Y2K readiness. Just to cite some of the examples of our educational and informational activities. We have developed a Y2K brochure that you should have in front of you. I'll hold it up in the event you don't. This brochure was given to all of our stores and distributed free to our customers. We've also been asked to send it to area schools and other institutions we have done so. We've also placed newspaper advertisements in the Washington Post and Baltimore Sun. Uh, this is a copy of one. This was also placed in other major weekly newspapers throughout our marketing area. We also decided to send personal letters to business, civic, and government leaders to inform them about our Y2K readiness. And finally, we addressed business and civic groups as we were often requested to do so. Plus, we've done a great deal more, all with the objective of informing our customers and the general public that at Giant Food, we are ready for Y2K. And I mentioned earlier, Mrs. Morella, uh, that I'm speaking on behalf of the Aho companies. All of the other Aho companies are also ready. We are a member of the Food Marketing Institute, which is an international association representing food retailers. They have also testified before Congress. The food industry is indeed ready. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Shear. I do think this is an excellent pamphlet. Uh, it is colorful, it is accessible, it is understandable, and uh, I commend you for, for it. I'm now pleased to recognize uh, Mr. J. Patrick Campbell, Chief Operating Officer of the NASDAQ Stock Market. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm pleased to be here. The SEC, the National Association of Security Dealers, the Securities Industry Associations, and other firms, exchanges, and utilities have been leading the way in, in, in an industry-wide effort to be Y2K ready. The NASD and each of its companies are prepared to transition successfully into the 21st century along with the rest of the securities industry. We are confident that our business systems, infrastructure, vendors, contingency plans, and transition command centers are ready. Investors should know that we have invested heavily to ensure that we are ready for the year 2000. In fact, the U.S. Senate and the GAO has given our industry its highest rating for Y2K preparedness. The NASD began in 1996 to ensure that the business systems of the NASD companies will transition to the year 2000 successfully. We believe that our capital markets in the United States are national treasures and their integrity is paramount. The NASD has spent $55 million, dedicated more than 100 staff to the effort. The NASD's Year 2000 program has remediated over 300 applications, 11 million lines of code in mainframe, mid-range, and desktop systems. The securities industry has treated the, treated the problem just as seriously and spent billions of dollars to meet the challenges that it poses. Our programs have been focused in three areas, the readiness of NASD internal and market systems, the readiness of our 5,600 member broker-dealers, and as important as anything, keeping investors well informed. The first aspect of the NASD's Year 2000 program deals with its internal systems, especially its market systems. The NASDAQ stock market and the American Stock Exchange, as well as all of the other exchanges, participated in a series of successful Year 2000 industry-wide tests conducted over four weekends, March and April of this year. The life cycle test simulated the securities transactions process for the dates of December 29, 30, 31 of 1999, and for January 3, 2000. The NASD tested its services with other participants all the way from our NASDAQ workstation terminals through our network into our data center and back end to end. The systems executed more than 170,000 simulated transactions for nine different security products over the tested dates. After this rigorous testing, we are confident that there will be no serious disruptions in our services and our markets and that investors will be protected. In addition to systems testing, we have also made extensive contingency plans to ensure business as usual and to protect our computing and communication systems as well as our physical facilities. As part of these efforts, the NASD has established corporate and business line command centers that will operate from late December through the first week in January 2000. We will pre-position staff, resources, strategically in each of these centers as well as around the country to ensure rapid, fast response to protect investors' interest. These centers will be linked to the SEC and under other industry organizations. A second major area of NASD focus has been on its broker-dealer members. In 1998, the Securities and Exchange Commission adopted a rule requiring all broker-dealers to report their readiness through two successive filings. We use this information to help our firms meet the Y2K challenge. We have held over 90 educational workshops coordinated with extensive update materials. A Year 2000 help desk has responded to member questions approaching 20,000 in the last two years. We also have allowed firms to post letters dealing with their readiness on our website to assure their investors that they can keep their money and assets safe. The third major area of 
NASD Y2K focus has been on investor education. A comprehensive investor, inve in investor education program has resulted in a coordinated campaign with all the major markets, the SEC, the Securities Industry Association, and the President's Council on year 2000. This coordinated campaign has communicated the readiness of the industry as well as practical tips for investors preparing their personal finances for the transition. Examples of these efforts include a year 2000 investor kit which has been made available to the members of the committee and is also posted on our World Wide Web as well as an open investor letter that ran today by coincidence in the Wall Street Journal and we will continue to run these letters uh, by all the markets in the country uh, basically expressing our Y2K uh, position. This open letter outlines the industry's preparations and repeats the advice to investors found in our investors kit. We appreciate this opportunity to testify and you should take comfort that we have since 1996 exercised, I think, our fiduciary responsibility to the nation and the people who are investors in our capital markets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell, uh, for your testimony, for what's been done, and thank you for being such a great constituent. Thank you. Uh, I'm now pleased to, um, uh, to recognize uh, Mr. Ronald Margolis, Chief Information Officer at the University of New Mexico Hospitals in Albuquerque and also representing the American Hospital Association. Mr. Margolis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm uh, Ron Margolis, Chief Information Officer at University of New Mexico Hospitals in Albuquerque. I'm here on behalf of the American Hospital Association and their 5,000 hospitals, health systems, networks, and other providers. I'd like to focus on four questions about the year 2000 in hospitals. Will hospitals be ready? How have hospitals been preparing over the past few years? What if something goes wrong? Finally, how are hospitals reassuring the public at this uh, last 55 days? Will hospitals be ready? In a word, the answer is yes. An AHA survey last spring found that 95% of hospitals expected that their medical devices, computerized information systems, and infrastructure to be Y2K compliant or to operate without a problem on December 31st. A report issued last month by the Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General also indicated high confidence in hospitals' Y2K readiness. For example, in New Mexico, our State Hospital Association survey very recently found that all systems directly related to patient care were expected to be compliant by the year's end and right now are greater than 96 percent prepared. It's reasonable to infer that since these surveys were conducted earlier in this uh, fall season, readiness among all hospitals has increased. <clears throat> How are hospitals preparing? Hospitals have taken inventory of all of our equipment, that's medical devices, computer systems, hardware, and software. From that inventory, a remediation or repair plan was developed and is now being completed. We have tested, using rigorous means, all of our computer systems with a special priority toward patient care systems to ensure that they will work well into the next millennium. We've developed and acquired software that allows us to warp the time ahead so that we were able, during the summer, to test systems for the period December 27th through April 1st, which includes the leap year, which is unusual this next year, as well as January 1st. Also, through manufacturer and vendor contact, we have determined other systems in medical devices which may be affected and how they will be affected. We are following up as required, which could mean anything from repairing a device, loading new software, or taking a device out of service for the period of the date change. Also, all hospitals plan to increase the level of staffing during the days surrounding the millennium date change. Hospital personnel will be on hand during the date change to make sure equipment is safe and working properly before being used on any patients. Let me point out that hospitals are somewhat unique in their use of technology. It's used as a clinical efficiency aid. 
Clinicians, of course, are fully able to perform nearly every, every function that patient support devices provide. We do not, under any circumstances, hook patients up to computers and then ignore their humanness. We certainly will not on December 31st. To paraphrase the slogan of a telephone company, in the medical world of technology, people make a difference, and we truly believe that's, that's a major differentiator. Nationally, the American Hospital Association is working with the President's Council on Y2K conversion and with other associations to make sure the availability of drug products, pharmaceuticals, and medical supplies will continue as needed into the new year. In New Mexico, hospitals are working closely with the two major drug houses to assure uninterrupted distribution of pharmaceutical supplies. What if something goes wrong? Here in Washington, members of the District of Columbia Hospital Association have pledged to back each other up in case of any kind of trouble or high demand for patient services. A memorandum of understanding provides a blueprint for inter-hospital support. This kind of cooperation is happening in communities all across America. In my state, hospitals are sharing information on medical devices, contingency plans, and performing readiness drills. We have emergency preparedness procedures in place at the state, county, and the local levels. We have emergency power generation capabilities that support all of our critical care and emergency facilities. Finally, how are hospitals reassuring the public? As hospitals continue to form their, perform their inside preparations, they are also reaching out to the communities. They are holding town meetings to ensure the people they serve are aware of what is being done. For example, New Mexico hospitals are taking part in Y2K community conversations. And in Albuquerque, local hospitals are participating in the Mayor's Millennium Committee, which has provided a public forum for citizens' concern and input. The, in summary, the AHA distributed to all of its members Healthcare and Y2K, What You Need to Know About Healthcare and the Year 2000. This booklet was developed jointly by the President's Council with the help of the American Hospital Association and other affiliated organizations to focus on consumer questions about Y2K. We encouraged all our members to make this easy to read booklet available to their communities. To conclude, Madam Chairman, Chairperson, the year 2000 issue will affect every aspect of American life. Few, if any, are as important as health care. What I've outlined today is merely a snapshot of a much more in-depth and thorough and united effort to ensure patient safety at midnight on January 1st and beyond. Hospitals and health care systems, their state associations, and the AHA are working together toward a smooth and healthy transition to the new millennium. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Margolis. I'm going to turn for questioning now first to a gentleman who hasn't had a chance to ask questions, the uh, a distinguished ranking member of the Government Management Information and Technology Subcommittee of Government Reform, Mr. Turner, the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Ms. Morella. Uh, I want to uh, commend each of our three witnesses on this panel. Uh, I can tell you've invested many hours and many dollars in trying to be ready uh, for Y2K. I've always uh, held the opinion, at least after our many months of study on this committee, that it's the myths about Y2K that could hurt us rather than the realities. Uh, and I didn't get the chance to ask Mr. Koskin uh, a question that I really think I will direct at Mr. Williamson. Perhaps he, in his work with the GAO, probably knows the answer uh, as well as Mr. Koskin. You know, the council that Mr. Koskin heads has a information coordination center, which as I understand it is designed to, to be a place that's kind of a central point for coordinating all, coordinating all information uh, about uh, Y2K problems, uh, about events that surround uh, the new year. And it seems to me that our, our emphasis at this point, after months of preparation, which I feel very good about, both in the public and the private sector, that we need to rethink a little bit about what we're doing to prepare to address the, the rumors and the myths that may surround um, the new year. Uh, in one of our recent meetings, I even suggested that perhaps Mr. Koskin's counsel should uh, bring aboard some high-profile, credible personality to be a spokesperson uh, as a clearinghouse, uh, someone who could answer uh, press inquiries and someone who could s 
pass along the, the realities and disperse uh, and dispel the myths, uh, somewhat of the, the caliber of Walter Cronkite. But it, it seems to me that uh, that's our, our, our real fear. And I, I can sense, Mr. Campbell, that you and the securities market would be particularly sensitive to uh, the rumors and the myths that may float uh, around the new year. You know, I come from a small town, and uh, in a small town, you know, we used to all understand that there were a lot of rumors that started at the bridge clubs and at the coffee shops. And if you circulated in the, in the right groups, you could pick up on those rumors, and they'd pretty quickly get around town. Um, with the advent of mass media, uh, television, radio, obviously information spreads much faster all across the country, but at least there, there's responsible journalism to kind of screen the information that comes across the airwaves. But on the internet, uh, you can put anything on there you want to and spread that story to tens of thousands of people in a matter of hours. And most of us on this committee have experienced uh, in our own offices receiving large volumes of mail on subjects that our constituents heard about over the internet that we turn around and have to write letters back to them and tell them what they read is absolutely false. There's no such uh, proposal in Congress to tax the internet or whatever the issue happens to be. And, and I'm fearful that uh, uh, Y2K offers the opportunity for <coughs> pranksters and, and for outright frauds uh, to run rampant on the internet and that we need to be very careful about how we structure uh, Mr. Koskin's information uh, center, coordination center, to be sure that it's going to not only be able to process uh, all of the myths that may surround uh, the new year, but be able to speak with credibility to dispel those myths. And Mr. Williamson, do you know uh, what Mr. Koskin has done to ensure that we're going to have that kind of response in place? I was over at the Information Coordination Center on Monday. Uh, they're located on about 18th and G, and uh, we uh, got a tour, my staff did, of uh, the facility. They do have a press briefing room set up, I think, for about 60 people. And as I recall, General Kind, uh, the head of the ICC, mentioned to me that uh, the plan was for uh, Mr. Koskinen to provide uh, press briefings approximately every four hours um, during that rollover period. Uh, secondly, uh, echoing back to one of the comments uh, you made earlier, as one uh, of the ideas that we've suggested before, uh, especially now that we're in November and entering into to December, is the executive branch may want to look at opportunities to use public service announcements uh, now and in December, rather than waiting for these um, for just the rollover period, especially to the extent uh, that uh, some may start to view Y2K as entertainment opportunities. Uh, as opportunities to uh, show worst case scenarios. I think uh, given uh, that, it's best to combat those kinds of uh, announcements with facts, uh, the facts that uh, we've discussed here today. So I think there still is an opportunity prior to that rollover period uh, to come out with those kind of announcements. Mr. Campbell, do you have similar plans for the securities industry to be able to speak with credibility and dispel rumors? Congressman Turner, yes, we do. Uh, we expect fully to have our command center staff from the 28th of December on. Uh, we have links, hot links, hotlines, uh, satellite communication, et cetera, with our vendors, with the news media, uh, with the uh, president's working group, with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, we have a broadcast facility, which we expect to have uh, Frank Zarb, our chairman, uh, available. Um, we will close our markets on December 31st at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. We have that afternoon, that evening, and the entire weekend. The, the way we dispel the myths is that Monday at 9.30, the capital markets in the United States open and they trade. Thank you. Well, I think we might could sustain a, a run on the grocery store, Mr. Shear, but I don't think we could sustain a run on the banks or the security market. 
Well, as I said earlier, on behalf of the food industry, we have been in an offensive manner of working with our, our customers and our vendors ever since earlier this year. And uh, the food industry has done a very good job of communicating to the consumer that there's no need to panic. And we're saying in ads and in the brochure, and the whole industry is, the food industry. If you are really worried, we advise you to stock up as if it were going to be a snowfall. And uh, no greater, no less, but if you're worried, get items like batteries and uh, perishable and non-perishable items. Of course, the, uh, the perishable items a day or so before, the non-perishable, we're telling people if you're really worried, you stock up now. But we are telling people there's no reason to do so. And we think we've done a good job of informing the public that you don't have to indeed panic. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morello. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Uh, Mr. Chair, you spoke on, on behalf of Giant Food, but how about other food distributors? Uh, are they in the same situation? Do you know? Well, the, the Ajo family, I mentioned earlier all the companies yeah. that are part of the Ajo family. It's over 1,000 stores along the East Coast. Uh, Dr. Tim Hammonds is president and CEO of the Food Marketing Institute. He has appeared before Congress. I know that other food chains have also appeared, and the message has been one of that the industry has worked on the issue. Uh, we're ready for Y2K, and we will indeed be ready. And I might add that that also goes for the vendors, the companies that supply the food retailers. We at Giant have contingency plans, but we also know that they have worked with other food chains around the country. So the manufacturers, the vendors, the people that supply us uh, within the food industry, they are also ready. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mr. Campbell, in your, in your testimony, you outlined uh, some categories of potential Y2K events, and I'm curious about an example that you might want to give with regard to uh, Y2K problems that uh, would affect business processing and be visible to the public. We start off with um, protecting our infrastructure and our technology with very basic starts where all of our computer facilities, including the one in Rockville, um, are fully self-contained entities, uh, starting with the electric power. Uh, our generator facilities um, have the capability uh, of operating our operations standalone. Our biggest concern has always been the fear that people will make decisions about economics in, in buying or selling their securities uh, based on a rumor. Uh, and it's our hope that our education has really uh, been at the forefront and that people should not make economic decisions based on non-economic rumors or baseless fact. We expect fully that all of our systems we have done the end-to-end -end testing. We have contingency plans that have addressed every area that we can humanly comprehend or think up. We have pre-positioned uh, technology response teams across the country, and we'll do so. Uh, to our way of thinking, uh, the, the worst part of any of the Y2K issues that we confront is the lack of investor education, and we continue to do that every day. Mm -hmm. oh, where are you going to be on January 1st, 2000? I will be in my command center uh, at, at K Street here. We will have a lot of our folks in Washington, as well as both our primary and backup computer facilities, uh, both in Connecticut and in Rockville. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Shear, are you going to be walking through the grocery store at oh, that time? We will be ready. Right. Mr. Margolis, you, you mentioned that uh, an inventory that had been done uh, had like something like 95 percent of the hospitals were compliant, but you assume that now there would be more. We want to speculate on how many more, and, and of those that are not compliant, are they like rural hospitals? And what would you do about that? Hmm. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think they, they would not be differentiated as being just rural or just urban hospitals. It's a, uh, the process of remediation with uh, the thousands of medical devices is a process of working with vendors and testing equipment. And I feel confident that that process continues to go on. Many vendors early on, and this is back in the spring of this year, 
we're not even certain about their equipment and what impact it would have on Y2K, so that it took them some period of time to check with their own chip processors that made the embedded chips and the other circuitry contained within the equipment. Uh, the, uh, the remediation efforts are nearly complete and that 95%, which is actually more recently in our state of New Mexico, 96%, is that equipment which has completely been remediated. And it's for that reason that I'm confident that the remaining 4% is in the last few days of checking out and finally getting its either Y2K compliance sticker or in pieces of equipment that should not be used because it questionably may fail it'll be locked in a closet as not Y2K compliant and then could be pulled back out after January 1st. Mm -hmm. And where are you going to be on January 1st? Well, we have a command center in the hospital. It's a, it's a conference room with about 25 telephone lines in it, which connects to the various departments. So uh, I won't be partying. You know, maybe we'll have some non-alcoholic punch available for 1 a.m. But in southwestern, in the Mountain States time zone, we will be watching closely what happens here on the East Coast and, of course, jointly with the AHA and the President's uh, Y2K task force, we'll be watching what happens to medical institutions and healthcare facilities in New Zealand, which is about 19 hours earlier than the Mountain State should specific pieces of equipment be affected. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Williamson, you've been very patient, and I know that my time personally has elapsed, but I just wanted to quickly mention that I, I was alarmed when I read that 56 education that 56 percent of the uh, elementary and secondary schools in the U.S. were not compliant, and I'm just wondering what what that can mean, and and um, uh, what what is it that we can do about it? This was like heating, security, telecommunications. The uh, education sector is one uh, that you should be concerned about. Um, education has gotten a late start, uh, as as Mr. Koskinen mentioned. They have made excellent progress. But when your starting point is relatively so late, um, it, there really is reason for concern. Uh, and so that one of the things that we've been emphasizing is the need for contingency plans uh, for those educational institutions. Oh, our survey of the uh, 25 of the largest school districts uh, found uh, many of them planning on December compliance dates. And as you know, uh, as well as anyone, uh, information technology related projects are often late so that when you are planning on the December compliance date it's going to be uh, uh, very difficult probably to make that date uh, for all of those school districts so I, I think there is a reason for concern and I think it, it's therefore incumbent uh, upon all of us to continue sounding the alarm for this particular sector uh, as um, uh, Mr. Koskinen and the Department of Education have done in the very recent past um, that needs to continue. Madam Chair. Uh, just yes, want, Mr. Margolis. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to comment on, uh, on higher education, particularly medical schools. One issue has been, uh, and we've talked about it collaboratively, is uh, uh, the safeguarding of research projects, research specimens that are refrigerated that could be affected if, if power is uh, lost. And at most major academic centers, and this certainly includes at the University of New Mexico at this point, emergency power is pl in place to assure that both uh, clinical laboratory specimens as well as uh, long-term research specimens, tumors such as, is uh, uh, under emergency power for continued refrigeration. It just shows the tremendous implications that one has to think of. You can't take anything for granted. I'm now pleased to recognize Mr. Bartlett. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't know what the estimates are as to the total amount that it's cost our country to get ready for uh, Y2K. My question is, we knew a long time ago that this problem was coming. We started very late. Had we started in uh, 1990 rather than 97 or 8 or 99, whenever we started, how much less, in your judgment, would we needed to have paid to solve this problem. Obviously, the longer we waited, the more technology was there that needed to be fixed and assessed, and it was going to cost more. How much less would it have cost us? You may give it as a percentage. Uh, in your judgment, would it have cost us if we had started this in 1990 rather than when we did? Uh, Mr. Bartlett, 
I believe that the cost would probably be insignificantly less because in the case of hospitals, and I'm sure in the case of financial institutions, there are so many interdependencies with other trading partners. Hospitals themselves uh, could very well have, uh, have upgraded their system, checked their devices, but without input from the manufacturers of certain components, they would have been waiting until the present time until a lot of information was made available. I think it's human nature to, uh, to think of things in the future when the future gets a little closer. I can speak from my own personal experience. I started out in computer programming and development myself in the 1970s, and we talked that many years ago about Y2K, and no one believed that the computer programs that we were writing then would even be remembered by the time 1999 came along. But, so they, but they have been remembered, That's and right. we still use them. And when did we stop using a two-digit code in programming, which would tell you when the cost of fixing it would be stabilized? I, I couldn't answer that question directly. I know at the hospital, we stopped, at our hospital, we stopped during the development of our current generation of uh, client information systems. But you know, I do know we've heard from other sectors that other software manufacturers have even introduced operating systems as recent as this year, which had system 2000 or, or year 2000 defects uh, but they're easily correctable because they're upgraded with a uh, with a later version of the software that's not to dispute why they were introduced as uh, being deficient to begin with though which is the basis for my question if starting 1990 we had produced no programs with a uh, two-digit date code wouldn't the, the problem have been a simpler fix I think it would have, but the interfaces between the systems would still be at issue. And in hospitals, that's the largest issue is that we have, in our specific hospital, we have 80-some systems that speak to one another, that transfer data between one another. So it's not only the interface programs that hand off that data, but each of the programs that have to be Y2K compliant in the same way or in a way that you can understand so that the data is properly translated. So that what you suggest would be the ideal. I'm not sure that the cooperation of all the trading partners would have been achieved until the pressure of Y2K, the President's Commission, and the Congress had been felt. Of course, if we had started with a four-digit date code, there would have been zero fix. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Okay. Mr. Campbell, our procrastination has cost us nothing? Whenever you procrastinate, it costs you something. Um, I would say that the greatest time that we have spent have been on our legacy systems, our older systems. Um, as you build a one-of-a-kind computer system in the world, uh, and you start back uh, many years ago, it's the legacy systems that take so much time to recertify. We would have also had uh, Congressman Bartlett had to certify all new systems that we put in place also. While it, it has cost us something, I think it's very difficult to place a percentage on it, and I don't think that percentage is, is, is a big percentage because of the integration testing and the certification of all systems across all vendors, across um, all different legacy and new systems. So even the systems that we put in today, we still make sure that we certify them as Y2K. Mr. Scherr? Within the food industry, most retailers, major retailers, started working on the problem two or three years ago. We don't believe there would have been significant cost savings. Uh, time is money, as they say. There probably would have been some better flexibility with time scheduling in advance. But uh, three years back, the industry looked at the situation and worked uh, aggressively, and uh, the retail industry is ready. Most people think of the food industry as a rab rather simple business. You go in, you buy groceries, you go home. Uh, looking at what we have developed as far as contingency, it's mind-boggling. Uh, things that we within the food industry, not just giant food, have had to be cognizant of include such things as advertising, uh, direct store delivery, our front-end operations, our fuel operations, uh, gas, uh, getting product to our stores from our various vendors, uh, perishables, payroll, areas of payroll, uh, what happens if there's a power failure, uh, store supplies, if we can't get store supplies, and transportation, water, and sewage. 
these are major issues that most people say, well, gee, I had no idea that that is what was necessary to run a food store. Uh, again, I don't think it would have saved a great deal of money. Uh, time, yes, if the industry would have worked a few years earlier. But again, most retailers that I'm familiar with have tackled the problem starting in about three years ago, 1996. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to ask Mr. Williamson just a, a simple question. Do you concur, sir, that uh, the major liability that we uh, 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 have in starting late is that we might not finish rather than it cost us more? I think the major liability is, is exactly that, that we may not finish in time. But I would also add that because we did get a late start, the pace for all intents and purposes was more frantic than it would have otherwise been. Um, and paying for that, you have to pay for that more frantic pace. Uh, speaking for the federal, from a federal government perspective, the most recent estimate we have, the 24 major federal departments and agencies is about $8.9 billion that it will uh, cost overall. Um, one could argue that if that had been stretched out over a longer period of time, it may have been less. Uh, indeed, there was a $3.35 billion emergency uh, supplemental that was uh, just for Y2K. One could argue that if, that had, if the effort had been stretched out over time, agencies could have funded these activities through their normal budgeting process. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. I'm pleased to recognize Ms. Biggert. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, one of the rumors that I've heard lately, um, and I don't know if it's a rumor, but so many of the hotel rooms in major cities uh, have been booked, not for the celebrations of, uh, of the turnover uh, on New Year's Eve, but the fact that so many companies are having so many staff uh, having to man the offices that they actually are having their families come into the cities and celebrate there because they will be involved with the, with the, with the, uh, the turnover. Is that true, Mr. Campbell, from your standpoint? Are the companies that... We have scheduled in Washington 10 rooms at the Mayflower. Uh, we have scheduled rooms across the country because our staff needs to be there prior to the date as well as the holiday traffic. Uh, so we have booked a considerable amount of room for the, uh, in the hotel industry around this country. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it will certainly be well spent if we have those glitches that somebody will be there. I also like to commend you on your uh, brochure and I guess this is a postcard? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And was this, is this something that was put into, um, like, store bills, or is this something that was set out through uh, information in your... It was sent out by our member broker-dealers across the country in the statements which they send to their customers every month. Have you had response from, from the customers, or...? We have had... Um, quite an active session on our websites uh, with customers and many of those customers uh, would directly ask the broker dealer uh, that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis many of the questions that they would ask us and then we would respond either directly or to the member firms themselves uh, but our help desk um, has, has responded to over 20,000 um, requests um, over the last uh, period of time. So it has been very active, uh, which is why we have, have really thought that education was probably the most important thing that we do. Has there been any evidence? I know one of the, the concerns about this has been fraud and that people were uh, coming out with schemes to try and make money from this or take away money from, from people, particularly seniors with scare tactics. Have you heard of anything where people have called uh, your offices saying that somebody has, has uh, tried to perpetrate something? Not that I'm aware of. The, the, the one issue that we have heard about uh, is inducing um, people to withdraw money from their bank mm -hmm. uh, in cash form uh, and then 
um, uh, defraud them of that in one form or another. By and large, the securities industry um, is is either book entry uh, or by certificate, uh, and the uh, ability um, for somebody to walk into an office and demand ready cash is generally um, not the same as a bank. Okay, and then Mr. Shear, uh, I know that we've had concerns that that there will be people who will decide at the last minute that they need to ensure that they have those uh, supplies that they hadn't thought about until the last day or so. Um, do you think that that still is going to happen? Or, and I, I do know that in a snowstorm, I'm coming from an area where we do have a lot of snow at that time of the year usually, that uh, uh, this, this happens even in a, in a major snowstorm where people rush to the grocery store at the last, the last minute. We have uh, extra merchandise that will be available in the stores in in-air warehouses, both perishable and non-perishable, to ship, and we can do that in a matter of hours if need be. I don't think you'll be seeing that. Earlier in 1999, the news media was hyping this up, and there was indeed a lot of interest by the part of consumers. What is going to happen? People were worried. We were getting dozens of media calls and consumer inquiries. Uh, let's advance to November of 1999. We're getting about six customer calls or letters a month, which is nothing. And all the news media calls today have died down significantly. I think they'll probably heighten slightly the last week of December. But the message has changed from the news media's perspective because of good reporting to there isn't any need to panic. The message, message today is that the industry is ready. And that includes the banking industry that I've read about food industry, the airlines. So I think the apprehension on the part of the consumer is a lot less today than it was beginning of this year. Good. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Biggert. And now please do um, recognize Mr. Osi. Thank you, Madam Chair. I first want to uh, commend uh, Mr. Shear's organization for this helpful pamphlet, which on the back lists any number of websites down at the bottom here that folks can uh, visit for additional information. And if they do not have access to the Internet, there's a phone number that they can call. It's a toll-free number for information on this. It's 888-USA-4Y2K. 888-USA-4Y2K. So my compliments to your organization for putting this together. Thank you. I, I can't let the occasion pass, Mr. Campbell, without expressing my compliments to you and your organization. So, Thank you. If I understand correctly from listening to each of you, the manner in which your business transacts an increasing amount of its commerce is electronically. I mean, the hospital folks are ordering supplies electronically. You're exchanging shares electronically. You're buying food and produce electronically, probably paying your people electronically with direct deposit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, each of those transactions goes over the telephone lines, in effect. It's a telephone conversation, which brings to my, my, my question, and I regret we don't have the opportunity to visit with someone today on that. Mr. Williamson, as far as the telephone companies, it's my understanding they're perhaps the most ready of all the various organizations in the country for this rollover. I would probably not go along with they are the most ready. I am much more optimistic today than when I testified in the summer of 1998. Uh, I would continue to say that the banking and finance sector is probably the most ready. Uh, within the telecommunications area, I think among some smaller local exchange carriers, there's still some level of concern about their readiness. So uh, bottom line for me on telecom, much more optimistic, um, but I would not put them at the absolute top of the heap. Well, that brings me to my, exactly to my question, and it relates primarily to Mr. Campbell's area of commerce, and that is on Friday, December 31st at 1 o'clock, the exchanges are going to close. And at 9.30 on Monday the 3rd, they're going to open. What's plan B if on Monday the 3rd there's been a problem? 
essentially we operate one of the largest private communications networks that there are. We have um, paired T1s uh, to every server um, that we have across the country and across the world. All of those private secure T1 lines have been tested and tested and tested. The servers which they interface with have been tested. We have, we believe, not only had physical on-site presence to those servers, but the end-to-end -end testing that we have uh, been involved in um, for quite some time um, leads us to believe that we know that our telephonic lines are operable in a Y2K environment. Um, we also have the ability um, to do many tests over that weekend, which we will. We don't quit testing. Um, we do believe uh, that the communications that transact share volume um, in the NASDAQ stock market are ready and operable and will be as they have throughout all of our end-to-end -end testing. We have transacted business coming in. We've, we've compared trades. The clearing organizations have vended the transparency of that trade back out at the price that it took place. We have gone through the order entry to the transaction all the way through the settlement and clearing process in a year 2000 environment, having rolled on numerous times our calendars forward, um, and we believe that we are ready. Um, if we have uh, issues to deal with, we will deal with them, um, but we believe that the integrated testing end-to-end -end that we have done, um, we are ready and we will be ready. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osi. It's uh, now my pleasure to uh, uh, recognize the uh, co-chair of the House Working Group on Y2K, uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Horn. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, let me start uh, with NASDAQ. Uh, it established the record high, as we all know, surpassing 3,000 and closing yesterday and technology stocks uh, really dominate uh, that uh, board. Last week, IBM announced that mainframe computer customers are waiting to buy new equipment until after January 1st as they grapple with their own Y2K, Y2K problems. What's the danger that Y2K could adversely affect the stock exchanges and investors' interests? First of all, I think that Whenever you approach year end, you either speed up your purchasing or you delay your purchasing, depending upon where you are with your budgets or the issues that you're dealing with. Uh, we do that at NASDAQ, and I know the federal government does that. Essentially, in IBM's case, I believe that it was a postponement, obviously, is what you said, and deferral of major purchases while they concentrated on making sure they were Y2K compliant. The SEC has been very diligent in requiring the disclosure of the Y2K risks that firms have. Uh, they have gone back and back, and those firms where they felt uh, they had not been um, as forthcoming as they would have desired have gone back to them and asked them for more uh, specificity with respect to their risks. I think that the technology companies are more aware of Y2K than and as sophisticated in the remediation because they are either the problem or they have been the solution. So relative to the damage that it would, would pose across the country, uh, I think that it will be very limited in scope. In terms of contingencies, which things do you have on Y2K problems that affect businesses? What is the contingency plan? Our contingency plan deals with 
many different levels of issues, uh, whether or not somebody has telephone issues, whether or not they have order entry issues, whether or not that they can operate their systems. We have it tiered in many layers. We have very specific reporting requirements over the weekend from December 31 to January 3rd. Those very specific reporting requirements go to uh, the different uh, capital markets and the regulators. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission has very specific reporting requirements over that weekend. Um, we will and have been linked in terms of all the communications uh, that will take place. So there are checklists for as many contingencies as our creative minds have been able to think up over the last couple of years. They are quantified, they are in books, they are in our command centers. Uh, we um, practice, we will continue to practice, uh, and we will have basically triaged as many different contingencies and, and unexpected kinds of issues that we know how to, to create. A number of us have said from the very beginning this is a management problem, not just a technological problem. What have you learned out of this experience that might be useful should some similar circumstance ever occur? It might be uh, the encryption bit and uh, how uh, little bright kids uh, break through computer security and all the rest of it. We deal with security issues every day. From a management perspective, my best training is probably as an Air Force pilot um, and knowing what to expect that nobody's ever trained you for. Essentially, not from only from our websites, but our private uh, communication systems to our computers, uh, to our people issues, I think that it has continued to make us more aware that it has to be done on every facet every day from a security perspective. So I think that it has been, at least from my perspective, a very broadening experience. Uh, hopefully I've learned something from it. Would any of you other witnesses like to comment on that? What have you learned from this that might uh, be worthwhile knowing? as a management problem when we ever get into something like this again. It obviously won't be this particular thing, hopefully, but it could be other things that relate to computers. That's a very good question, Mr. Horn. We're looking at Y2K as a uh, opportunity that we think we will not miss a heartbeat. It will pass us by. But your question is a good one. In the event of a natural disaster within the food industry, let's take just one segment, well, people on welfare, people that receive government benefits from the state and federal levels. If the phones go down, for example, people that are on the electronic benefit transfer program, which is almost throughout the United States today, they would go into a food store and not be able to access their benefits. So what have we learned? We've learned that aside from Y2K, we should indeed have good contingency plans in the event of for example, telephones go out. A large segment of our, our customer base would not be able to shop for something they need to survive, food. So we have to look at al alternative plans to handle a situation. For an example, if telephone lines go down again, how do we serve that customer? And it's a question that we discussed today with one of our other uh, owners, one of the other members of the Ajo family, Giant Food Stores of Carlisle, and we don't have the answer. It's a very good question Aside from Y2K, if the phone lines go down, how do we serve this important segment of our business? And we're going to be addressing that also. So it, it has widened their horizons, it's opened their eyes to look at possible other disasters that could occur within the retail business. How do we solve those problems? Some of the solutions are inherent with what we have found out with Y2K. Others we'll be exploring over the next few months. <coughs> but it has indeed opened our eyes to potential other disasters that could occur. Would cellular phones be one of the options? Your major uh, customers? Possibly. Direct line? If phone lines go down and a welfare individual or families in a food store, they're at the checkout. We have to currently, if, if the computer doesn't work today, we have a number that we can call 
within the state government to make sure that the benefits of their so-called account has funds in it. Uh, cellular line would work perfectly for that. It's a little cumbersome, but we would have to resort to something other than uh, telephone lines, and that's what we would use. Uh, Mr. Shear, in terms of the food situation, is there a concern within the food retail distribution uh, industry about transportation being available to get the products you need on a regular basis. I assume a lot of the stores use what they, we call the Japanese inventory approach. On a timely basis, it gets there based on the demand. Is uh, there going to be stockpiling in some cases in the back of particular stores if they well, don't have the space? Mr. Horn, for certain commodities within uh, the food industry, uh, yes, the food the food stores, to the best of their ability, have small back rooms, but they will stock up with extra merchandise. Uh, air warehouses will also have certain items that we know that if there's a snowstorm, people would normally buy, uh, including such items that are uh, non-perishable, like the batteries and candles. Uh, we will have air truck fleet standing by in the event that we see uh, panic buying occurring, we'll be able to ship merchandise to the stores. But with certain commodity groups, we will have excess product in the store just to be safe. Uh, let me ask the uh, gentleman from New Mexico. Uh, I've long admired the uh, medical school at the University of New Mexico. I'm curious. They were the ones that in the freshman year of medical school uh, mixed the students studying medicine with actual patients and not just the dull biochem or whatever courses, anatomy, so forth, but saw relating them to real human beings. Does that still go on in New Mexico? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Hort, it does. It's the uh, uh, encounter or problem-based medical training, and it, uh, they were pioneers in that, uh, that area. Well, they were number one, but uh, Harvard <laughs> got the publicity because it's Harvard. Well, I'm and, glad that story's and, traveled and having back. Having headed a state <laughs> university and been ahead of a lot of those people, but you never get publicity because you don't have 35 people on your, your staff. <laughs> That's so, right. Uh, I was just wondering if that kept going because I've had a great respect for that institution for 20 years. I'll, I'll let the dean know. He'll be very yeah. glad to hear that. <laughs> well, it's a very interesting situation. Let me ask you with the AHA. When we were in Cleveland, uh, the representative of the Cleveland Clinic, a very distinguished group of hospitals, uh, was our witness and noted that uh, there was a common website where you could check out the equipment as to uh, machine number, uh, patent, and all the rest of it. You didn't have to reinvent the wheel if you were checking your uh, various pieces of equipment in the emergency room. And uh, has that worked pretty well? And uh, has the hospital profession been able to get and share information with each other? so they don't have to reinvent the wheel? Yes, that, that has worked very well, and actually through the uh, leverage of the state hospital associations and the American Hospital Association, we have shared a lot of uh, information like that. The, the FDA, as you know, has a site for medical devices where you can check serial number, manufacturer, and other information to, uh, to rely upon uh, the piece of equipment being tested by the manufacturer, which is often the safest the safest reliance you can have. In addition, the hospital, the American Hospital Association has put together a monthly telephone conference line, both for one for rural hospitals and one for large urban hospitals, where on a monthly basis for the last 11 months, we've shared information regarding what we found with our vendors, what we found in our own institutions, and how our remediation plans have been going, which has been an excellent uh, forum for learning from one another and avoiding that issue of reinventing the wheel. So it's, uh, it's important, although in many ways we're competitive with other hospitals in our community, it's important to share certain levels of data because we are community service-based providers and it's, uh, it's critical that we be able to respond as a team and not as a single hospital island. Now a lot of the manufacturers of some of that emergency equipment probably were out of business and did you find there were ways to get replacements for some piece, or did you just have to go and let's buy something new? In some cases, uh, uh, I, I can think of three or four pieces of equipment, and that was in, uh, I believe, EKG pieces of equipment that had to be replaced because the manufacturer, in fact, had been out of business for something more than 10 or 12 years, and there was uh, uh, no 
successor to that manufacturer that could provide the upgrade. The reality is a piece of equipment like that has a useful life of eight to ten years, so on the one hand it was probably time to replace it, but as you know and commented about New Mexico, we probably didn't have the money to budget to replace it, so we would have liked to have kept it running. But for the most part, there has been successor companies who are able to provide the upgraded software and in many cases the upgraded computer processing board which allowed that piece of equipment to operate, uh, will, will allow it to operate beyond January 1st. Most of that was done under warranty or maintenance service agreements that we had. It was a, uh, a, it is a large challenge for hospitals to have identified all that, but that's part of their remediation plan and as you pointed out, much of that information has been shared over, over various websites. Now, in going through this exercise, which nobody wanted to obviously do, but you had to do it for your own uh, computer systems, have you learned something that will help you in better arranging new computers which are needed in terms of a new generation? We're always out the minute we bought one. It's uh, three years out of whack anyhow. But uh, what have we learned from that in terms of did we need all those programs? Could you get rid of some? Could you merge some? Did anybody use that as an exercise to say, why are we doing this? I think a, a, a valuable lesson that we've learned is the compatibility between equipment and the need to, when procuring equipment or software, which is mostly what hospitals do rather than develop their own software, is to use uh, common standards in data communication to insist that vendors can provide that common interface. The, uh, uh, there, are, there are committees of, uh, of the healthcare of HICFA, I believe, that have defined something called HL7, which is a standard of data interface. And that's become very popular in the last two years to insist that vendors provide software that can communicate using this HL7 interchange. I think that's probably the most valuable lesson because that will ensure not only for year 3000, which is quite a, quite a distance off, but for various things that happen in terms of federal programs and insurance programs that various pieces of the data process share the same codes for the same uh, meaning, meaningfulness of the data. The way you're getting uh, new replacements for some of us. Uh, we might be around in the year 3000. You I hope I am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, what, you, you gentlemen really did a great job in your, your presentations, your written presentations. I think it's one of the best panels we've ever had before us, and it was very useful to what you've gone through. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Wilmington, who has followed us everywhere in the United States, overseas, you name it, and uh, we usually ask him because he's got all this knowledge to say, what have we missed? And uh, what would you suggest? Ask some questions that uh, make sense to you. I think you really touched on some of the, uh, the key points uh, that you'd want to hear from these witnesses. The only thing I might add from a lessons learned perspective uh, that maybe these sectors have learned that we've definitely learned in the federal government is uh, going into this and going into future uh, information technology problems such as this, you need to focus on the business function first and the system second instead of thinking systems and then how do they work uh, for the business uh, and that's one lesson learned in the federal government is uh, focusing on the programs and then looking at the supporting systems uh, rather than the other way around. Uh, anybody want to add something that came to mind that we didn't ask you? Uh, this is your chance. <laughs> well, if Mr. I, if Chairman, I, I have to your left. Yeah. To your left. Okay. I have one thing I want to make sure that Mr. Shear addresses because come January 1st, if there's not an adequate supply of Oreo cookies <laughs> in his store, he's going to have trouble. Is this they, a chocolate They comic? will be there. Yeah. I promise yeah. you. You're talking to a Marylander. We believe in the <laughs> Orioles. <laughs> However you spell it. Well, if the chair would uh, indulge me, there's a few closing remarks I'd like to make uh, that I didn't make it because I wasn't here. I was and in a markup of my subcommittee. Mr. Chairman, before you make the closing remarks, may I just ask one other question? And I, we are also going to open it to members of the committee of uh, both subcommittees to be able to present any other questions to you if, uh, that is amenable. But I, I just had a question that dealt with an article that I saw in USA Today. 
uh, was an article that indicated that a number of companies have uh, failed to comply with SEC regulations requiring full disclosure of a company's vulnerability to Y2K. I just wondered if any of you wanted to comment on, is this a widespread problem? Does this uh, imperil um, investor confidence? Because I think it would affect all of you. I just wondered if you wanted to make any comment on that. It's my understanding, Madam Chair, that it is a very small contained group of companies that the SEC uh, has gone back and asked for further information. Obviously, the most important thing that the management of a company can do is maximize and protect their shareholder value, and those companies that don't have full disclosure obviously risk that. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Have no any? problem. Because it would affect actually all of you. And, and are you okay with, uh, I know you, NASDAQ is going international, but the Asian markets, um, the interoperability concept? We are moving forward relative to globalization of our markets. Uh, the links at this present time uh, do not provide uh, major risk uh, to the U.S. capital markets. Um, essentially, we will know early uh, whether those markets operate, how they operate, but the, uh, the connection between the markets uh, is not there at this point in time. So at least to United States citizens, um, the issue relative to the, their domestic securities is not an issue. Uh, it's their foreign-owned securities. Um, we have not had any direct conversation with the foreign markets uh, except in terms of exchanging information about Y2K uh, from a technology perspective. Um, so I really can't address mm -hmm. that. If there were a run on the Asian markets and you found out, you know, before it happened here, how would you react? I think our reaction would be to address the confidence issue in our domestic markets. I think all of our markets, all the regional markets, the national exchanges um, would address those in concert along with the SEC. Uh, the most, we believe, important facet of our markets are there is confidence in them, they are well regulated, they are transparent, uh, and they do protect the investor. Uh, and that happens nowhere else in the world like it happens here. So we would address that very openly and very directly, and we would share with the investing public exactly what is happening. Mm -hmm. Mr. Williamson, you want to comment on that issue at all? We have not done an analysis of that uh, particular issue, so I'm not in a position to comment. Thank you. I want to thank all of you, too, and now I'm going to defer to, the, uh, uh, to Chairman Horn, the co-chair. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Uh, no one really knows what's going to happen on uh, January 1st and December 31st in terms of uh, what happens when we uh, switch over. Uh, we've got predictions that are springing up like wildflowers about this. We have eager entrepreneurs promoting their year 2000 survival kits. Uh, we have some of the people in the county jail have already talked to the uh, warden and the captain of the guard to say, could you let me off for uh, December 31st and January 1st because they think everybody will take money out of the bank and put it in their homes. Now, that's the stupidest thing an American citizen or any American here uh, could do was take money out of the bank and put it in their homes because that's just where the robbers and burglars and all the rest of them uh, will be uh, looking. And uh, already I read into one hearing an Ann, an, a letter to Ann Landers on the scams already happening to elderly citizens. And uh, all I can say is it needs to be buyer beware in those last few days in terms of people selling you things you really don't need. And uh, a lot of them just might collapse on you anyhow. I've been looking at Oh, probably a hundred different magazines over the last uh, couple of weeks and seen these ads that are the kinds of things you'll see in the National Enquirer or something that want to scare your wits out of you. And uh, 
but we do have some real problems. And of course, some of this is just uh, amusing in a way, but it uh, certainly is upsetting people. For example, in 1993, Minnesota officials instructed 104-year-old Mary Bander to report to kindergarten. Now, it turned out that the state computers had misread Ms. Bander's 1889 birth date as 1989, placing her at age four. Recently in Maine, several hundred car owners were displayed uh, to find the titles to their New Year 2000, 2000 model vehicles categorized as horseless carriages. State computers had misread the year 2000 as 1900. Well, we can get by those things, but uh, some of the more serious ones. Uh, obviously worry us, and that's how you get gas from Russia to Eastern Europe, Central Europe. Would that affect the United States in any way? Uh, will the electricity fail? So forth. Now, both the administration and the Congress have looked at a number of these questions around the country, and uh, I think people have been very prepared. When we had a problem on nuclear reactors, we asked the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to look at all of them not just 10 percent. They were only going to look at 10 percent. They've looked at all of them, and presumably that situation, which generates electricity, uh, is okay. But we really won't know until you get it all in an operational se uh, s sector where you have all of these different factors coming together in a typical operational day. And that's the main thing we really have to care about. Uh, we will have two more things in terms of these two subcommittees. One, we will hold the final grade uh, release to the press uh, on November 22nd, a Monday, and uh, the staffs uh, and the GAO team that has worked uh, very closely with us uh, will uh, be doing the work of analysis that week, and uh, we think uh, that uh, should tell us a little bit about at least the executive branch. And I think uh, Mr. Koskinen and his team have uh, done a fairly good job. The question is, could it all have been done earlier? And would it have cost less? We still have shades of panic even in the executive branch as well as in private industry when a lot of their talented people have been bought out from under them by other industries who want talented people. And the question will be, did we have enough human resources in the right place at the right time? Again, that's a management question. So, uh, Madam Chairman, I think uh, with uh, we hope you'll be there on November 22nd. And then uh, your committee and mine, after this is all over, will have a uh, retrospect summing up if something has gone wrong and uh, what could we have done to get the administration to do it the right way then. And uh, I was worried for several years over the procrastination. I think they have played catch up, and I hope they have make it, because that's uh, what we need. We shouldn't have to do things that uh, are just fouled up and uh, not run on a steady track of some sort of management approach to solving the problem. And so that's where we are. We don't know what's going to happen on January 2nd and December 31st, but uh, you certainly give us some heartening hope that in major industries that you represent, the hospitals, the grocery industry, the stock markets. Uh, I know the stock markets were one of our first witnesses when we started, and uh, I think they've done a splendid job. So thank you all for coming. and. Uh, Ms. Morella, I think we have uh, a uh, mm -hmm. yeah, tribute. the tributes and, and to the And as he staff. gives the tributes, I, I want to indicate I would agree that the, the cost has escalated. Maybe it wouldn't have had we started earlier, because I remember the first submission by the president was $2.3 billion. Remember that, Mr. Williamson? Now it's 8.9 and probably continuing. but. Um, we will be continuing to monitor, and we appreciate very much your being here and for your patience for being here all afternoon. Um, yeah, I might Jim add Hine. that the uh, Gartner Group, when they testified before our subcommittee, said, oh, it will be about a $30 billion cost in the case of the federal government. And uh, we think and we thought as it went along, and we simply pulled it out of the air, but that's the way they sometimes build budgets around here. 
had thought it would be $10 billion, and that's about where it is, I believe. So we're going to thank our staff that has stuck with this now since 1996. Uh, Russell George, the staff director and chief counsel, is standing against the wall there. Uh, don't worry, we're not uh, some Latin American <laughs> banana republic where people that stand b by walls are in trouble. Uh, you're in good shape. Uh, Matt Ryan, senior policy director, is uh, right behind me here. Uh, and uh, Bonnie Heald, communications director, is uh, probably working with the press. Uh, Chip Allsweed, our clerk, is right there with them. Uh, Rob Singer, the staff assistant. Uh, P.J. Caceres, intern. Deborah Oppenheim uh, is intern. And that's all of our staff. And then Mrs. Morella's staff, the subcommittee on technology of science. Full committee is Jeff Grove, the staff director, Ben Wu behind us, uh, counsel, Joe Sullivan, staff assistant, and the minority staff on the government management team is Trey Henderson, minority counsel, Gene Gosa, the staff assistant, and the technological subcommittee is Michael Queer, the professional staff member, and uh, Marty Ralston, uh, staff assistant, and the court reporter is Ruth Griffin and we thank them all for all they've done. They've worked overtime many a night, many a weekend to get the job done, and we appreciate it. They have been our, we have now adjourned the com committee meeting. Here's what's coming up. Next, a panel discussion on the fall of the Soviet Union.